exquisite luring. When you watch it, it looks so straightforward and so easy. You wonder why you never did it. But then when you start to do it, you realize it needs good hands. It certainly needs good hands, good balance. Yep. That's Kay Lawrence from Learning About Dogs. And this is the podcast, Learning About Dogs. This is our second episode on the art of luring. Kay will be starting a six-week online course on the skills of luring through Learning About Dogs. The course starts May 8th, and signups are happening now. I'm Sue McGuire, the manager of a canine behavior program at a nonprofit animal shelter north of San Francisco. And joining me, of course, is Kay Lawrence. Cup on a stick. I had never seen that before until I saw you use it. Well, mm-hmm. well, going on from, I mean, luring is often a thought, a lot of stuff that people do from their hand. But if I want to do something in the future where my hands might give the dog wrong information, I don't want the lure to be associated with my hands necessarily. So you may actually lure with a container. So say we want the dog to do a chin rest on a a chair so that we can do husbandry behaviors while they're still. I would put the pot of food on the back of the chair. um, And that means I can step out the picture. I haven't had to use me or my hands to teach the dog to do it. Or I might be teaching a dog to walk backwards and we're using a target and the dog goes backwards. The target mat then is what the dog stops on as they go backwards. But the treat pot will be right by the side of that target mat. So, you know, the placement of a container can also be used as a lure because I assure you the dogs know where they are. And then I come to the container and get the food out of it. So luring doesn't have to be handheld lures. So then the third one would be the cup on a stick. Now, a cup on a stick is like, um, you know, you buy those sets of four measuring cups which is a, I know it's an American thing. Uh, So in other words, outside America, we don't use cups as measures. What do you use? (laughs) What do we use? Well, we use the weighing scales. Yeah, we use the weighing scales. Oh, yeah, they do, huh? I've seen that on British Baking Show. They always weigh things. A cup thing. I think the cup thing is quite neat because it's proportional. So if it's one cup of, I don't quote me on this, one cup of flour would be proportional to half a cup of sugar. Um, Are you with me? So the the things are proportional. No, no, we would have it's eight ounces of flour and four ounces of sugar and you weigh it up. So cups, (laughs) measuring cups, were not something of my youth. They've only come in the last sort of 10 years. In actual fact, I don't think, you know, in mainland Europe, they've ever heard of cups as a a cooking tool. So we buy the metal ones. um, And I like to buy the ones with the square bottoms because when you... Um, hold the cup vertically or just slightly off vertical that treat will still stay in the cup at the bottom in the in the in the sort of corner of the cup if you buy the round bottom ones that treats out before you've even known about it notice that so the round bottoms cups tend to be measuring for liquids i think and the um like scoops but i wouldn't i wouldn't recommend those then we attach those to a short stick well a stick about probably three foot long about that uh two foot's adequate and the treat goes into the cup. The cup is then wafted in the region of the dog's nose. Usually it has to go under the nose because then the scent will come up and the dog goes, yeah, I like cups. And now we move the cup for the dog to follow. So the dog never takes food out of the cup. The cup is just an extension to your hand that we teach the dog to follow. Again, six to 10 inches away. Um, And as soon as you've got the follow, the cup will turn and place the food on the floor. So it develops its own language. If the cup is going along horizontal, the dog will follow it. If the cup goes down and starts to turn, that's the promise that the food's coming to the floor and the dog will start to speed up as they get the food to the floor. So a downward moving cup will get the dog to speed up. And if they're trying to knock the cup to get the food out of it, if you just elevate it out of range, they'll recognize that when a cup goes upwards, they need to slow down. So this gives us exquisite language to be able to teach the dog hundreds of behaviors without our hands being involved and that's one of the anxious areas where people will go from oh i don't want to lure because you can't get rid of the lure well this is this is so easy to actually just teach the dogs to do the behaviors with the cup yes we need the lure but we turn it into the consequence rather than the um, what's eliciting the behavior very quickly so then you have to fade the cup 
at some point too? Well, this is a this is a big question. I don't. I just take it away, and you've got the behaviour left. But it depends what you're trying to teach. So, if I was teaching, so if I was teaching a dog, um, one of the things we do, say, to go round a cone, to go round an object, go round a chair, or go under a chair, or round the wing of a jump. Now, this has got quite a lot of motor skills that the dog needs to learn, particularly if they're going to do it at speed. Say it's a run round a cone, much like you'd run round a, a jump or you'd wheeze through a person's legs. I want the dog to do this quite slowly to start with. So they follow the cup, make a perfect loop, come back to where they were coming from. There's the food on the floor. As the food goes on the floor, I reload the cup. The dog finishes, that cup's there straight away, and they do the same behavior again. So we get a quite a good rhythm going on this quite quickly. As the dog turns that circle around the object, they are learning to counteract centrifugal forces and learning to balance themselves as they race around the turn. So the same as teaching a dog to walk as opposed to trot, teaching the dog to transition from walking into trotting or teaching the dog to transition from trotting down to a balanced stand. We also teach it for balance when they're walking backwards. So I like to use the cup to teach the dog how to use their body well. So we might teach the uh, use the cup to teach them to go over object, objects like uh, the Cavaletti poles, mm -hmm. um, making sure that if the dog's watching the cup, they can also see what they're stepping over because the cup will often blind them to what's in front of them and they fall over it, la di da di da because it's too high. So it needs to be, the cup needs to be low enough for the dog to see the poles, but enough information to take them across the poles. Now, once I've taught the dogs these motor skills, I'll put the cup away and I will shape up the behavior again. But because the dog has already got recent, very recent memory in their system as to what they were doing, it would probably only take me a maximum of five repetitions to actually go round the cone without the cup. So if you like, we go cold turkey, start from scratch. But because the dog's already got these skills on board, yes, they've got their balance. There's no stress in learning how to do this behavior. They just go with it within about five goes. So we don't really fade it so much as put it away. And if I'm teaching something like um, uh, heel work, where I want the dog very collected during heel work, I will keep bringing back that cup as a warm-up tool, probably for the rest of that dog's competitive life, because it manages the behavior. It actually stops them going too fast. It stops them racing. It's making sure they stay in balance because the cup allows me the distance between me and the dog to see that they're moving properly. Um, and then that's their warm up, learning how to do their turns, their circles, to go round objects, but to stay in balance. Then I'll put the cup away and I'll cue the behavior without the cup and we're, we're away. So we don't really fade the cup, if that's common sense. Yeah. But I, I'm just going to stick in because um, I can see another episode coming up about how you want to teach things slowly and then speed them up as opposed to. Yes, yes. Yeah. So we teach the, the um, um, I mean, I've never done dressage work, but obviously people that do horse work are very capable of knowing the difference between um, ambling, walking, pacing, trotting, country. Because they've had to. They're sitting yeah. on this animal. They need to know the difference. But dog people are pretty poor at identifying these speeds. So um, teaching a dog to do a lateral movement, uh, very often the dog people will teach a perfectly uh, parallel front and back legs, opening and shutting, open, shut, open, shut, open, shut. And it's the most unnatural movement. Whereas when a four-legged animal moves sideways, it is um, one leg actually crosses over in front of the other leg and this the hardest one to teach of this is the back leg so we teach the dogs to do a very well balanced pivot uh, and we teach this action with the cup yes because you can't see it if you do it over the top of the dog um, and later on then when we say to the dog can you pivot or can you move sad laterally sideways yes of course i can because they've already learned how to do it properly so learning how to see movement I think we owe it to every person that wants to do, you know, beyond the average pet dog stuff. They they need to know how their dog should move naturally, be able to recognize when it's not natural, encourage it, reinforce it, same as sit or good sit. Sit or just 
park your ass, which is the difference. One is a flop mm -hmm. down and the other is a controlled movement. And if this movement's happening hundreds and hundreds of times over the dog's life, then it's our responsibility to make sure it happens well. Is this uh, cup and a stick technology going to be as part of your luring course that you're well, it is you luring. coming up? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Is, absolutely. Is. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Because, you know, people need, again, that is something you can practice without the dog. We know we say practice with beans, load up. So you do hold a hand of about six to 10 treats and you will have to load without having to take your eyes off the dog. And you will have to know the difference between taking the cup to the other hand to load it as opposed to keeping the cup where it is and taking the hand that's holding the reserves to the cup. Those small things make a difference to the dog, otherwise they lose the connection. Learning how to move the cup in balance at the right height. Learning how to deliver on the spot. Or if you want some energy in this behavior, you need to be able to bung this food across the room. So you give it more of a catapult type of action. How to connect with the cup. Yeah. Oh, it's all part of luring. And I, you know, as a elegant way of teaching... Uh, I mean, the, the girls nickname it coas training, cup on a stick. <laughs> um, we are, you know, it just becomes so much easier to teach stuff that we struggle to teach because you can see it easily. And very often, you know, somebody says, well, I want to teach my dog to walk backwards, but I find it really hard to see where the back foot is. And I go, so, so what's the back foot got to do with it? Oh, well, I want to click when the dog's back feet are on the mat. I said, well, why don't you wait till the front feet are on the mat if the dog's backing away from you? Oh, yeah, yeah. Because we don't want to make it harder for us to be able to mark success. So if we can use a tool that gives us more space between ourselves and the dogs, you can see the action brilliantly without having to peer down to see what the dog's doing. So, yep, cup on a stick. And if you've got somebody that's a little bit um, anxious or doesn't like to handle the treats or their, their dog is a bit sharp at taking them, that cup on the stick takes that all away. And if I am going to train a tiger one day, I, I will train with a cup on a stick and a fence <laughs> and a fence between me and the dog, tiger. Uh, a, a big, a big fence. Yes. Uh, yeah, you know, I've been playing with a cup on a stick with my new little guy, Hank Williams. Yep. And, uh, Again, really small dog. By. Oh, very how would small you dog. lure a small dog? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and the thing I have to uh, really struggle with is, you know, I'm, I'm thinking, okay, I need to change the, the, the angle just a little bit on this stick so I'm not having to bend over so much. Yes, 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 you know, yes. Because he is, he's... Well, this is where these square bottom cups, I say you can, you can, you can stand upright and that cup can be at ankle yeah. height. If it's just off vertical, two or three degrees off vertical, it will not lose the treat. Yep, so you yeah. can actually yeah. lure him under something at you know, three inches high, you could lure him under that easily with a cup without ever having to bend over. Yeah. Yep. You know, so it, yeah. it just you, uh... changes everything from, for, you know, makes any training method that's good for some dogs, but not for all dogs starts to become, yeah, but, you know, and a lot of the training mm -hmm. methods, we're not saying they're not good, but they only suit certain types of dogs or certain sizes of dogs, or that dogs that love this or dogs that don't like that, you know, it starts to become a yes, but this will work for, but we have a lady in a wheelchair that uses a cup on a stick to teach freestyle. And it's so much easier for her. So much easier for her. Huh. Yeah. That would be fabulous. Yes. Mm. Hey, do you use a clicker? With a cup on a stick? Not necessarily. I don't think it's something you need to burden yourself with. I mean, if you were teaching rehabilitation after an injury you could maybe mark a certain way that they move a back leg if they've had something like knee surgery if they actually as they transfer their weight properly onto it instead of avoiding weight transfer if you are able to anticipate it because using the clicker means you've got to be able to anticipate when this action is going to happen it might be useful, but generally the turning of the cup or the lowering of the cup will tell the dog the treat's coming. It's that that they keep on the game for. And one of the side benefits that came out of the cup on a stick, which wasn't apparent until we started to use it for a while, is the dog's focus on this cup is superb. So the first time I taught it was um, to get um, Merrick when she was a puppy to teach her a show stand, show gating and show stand. And if she's got that cup on a stick, nothing will deviate her vision from that cup on a stick. Whereas if you used a target on a stick, which is what we've used for the last 20 years before this, 
yes, they'll follow the target, but their eyes are also aware of what our hands are doing because that's where the reinforce is coming from. So you'll see them follow the target and we get the trot and we get the go around the cone, but there's also that flicker all the time to every movement of the hand, which virtually distracts the dog from following the target. So just by using the food in the cup, um, the attention and focus the dogs give to it is 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 continuous. And I think it's because the cup always pays off. It's never empty. That food will come from the cup. And anything I then fart about with my hands or whether I stop or stand still, it's the cup they'll stay focused to. What an exquisite example of having your reinforcement pattern so clean. Yes, Yes, so yes, clear. yes. And the evidence that it's our unreliability of reinforcement that causes the loss of focus. So if I was teaching, you know, a young puppy how to follow the cup and, and do various things and they start to get loss of focus, it's nearly always an indicator they're getting tired or you've asked them to do the behavior for too long. It's not because they're not interested in the in the food, particularly if that food's going to go into a a chase at the end of it you know they will stay glued to this and then you know the the question is oh but how do you wean them off the cup the cup starts to become irrelevant you know it's just a source of where the food's coming from so i can use empty cups these days <laughs> not intentionally but i often you if you've used sort of food that's slightly sticky uh, with the fat on it you turn the cup upside down and you realize nothing happens well the dog will stay with the cup it's stuck. yes you know whether it's there or not the dog will stay with the cup um so the food can be delivered after the cup if you needed it to you don't need to have the food in it but with a history of two or three years of that cup always delivering you could use the cup without food not that i ever yeah. need to but mm -hmm. it's, it's not a question of Oh, but if the cup's not got any food, they won't follow a target. It's the behavior they learn while they're following the target that's the important bit. It wasn't the following of the target that was the important bit. Does that make sense? It's learning how to trot in a balanced yeah. way. It's learning how to move in a certain way. It's learning how to to use your body in a certain way that just by following the cup, we can teach this well. This behavior then emerges, becomes fluent, becomes strong, becomes powerful. And if you want to do rehabilitation work, just asking the dog to walk in a balanced fashion with the head perfectly aligned to the body, where you're in a position where you can see the dog place each foot. And you could actually ask the dog then to walk on different types of surfaces. Or um, we were talking to somebody the other day whose physiotherapist wanted the dog to back up um, but to actually start to put more action into the back legs because it's had surgery on both the knees. And I suggested, well, what if you walk back up a ramp very slowly? Wow, perfect. Yes, so that you can see this with that cup on a stick. Wouldn't mm. do without it now. Travel with my cups and sticks. They don't have rattle in the back of the car. You do? <laughs> oh, yes, yes, they go in my suitcase. I might. <laughs> Yeah, I might have a few behind my head right now in my yes. office. Um, <laughs> but no, the clicker so just the wrap. clicker is not of a particular benefit. I, we did start to begin with everyone wanted to use a clicker, but I couldn't see that there was any benefit of using a clicker. Yeah, I didn't really feel like the dog was attending to the click so much as the, the movement of the cup. the cup. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 So let's wrap this around back to luring in general. Um Behaviors that you would lure, behaviors that you don't lure, or are we actually just always luring? Oh, I certainly think skillful luring, you're going to get much more accuracy. So you can lure a dog um, to do, for instance, the, uh, do you call it the cantilever down, where the dog is standing perfectly mm -hmm. full square, and I want it to drop down backwards into a down? and keep the spine level all the way. I don't want this sit flop down. I want that, that controlled down action and I want the controlled stand up action. I would always teach that with a lure. Mm -hmm. Yes, because it, it's what you get is a perfectly accurate movement at the end of it. You know, so, so anything that requires exquisite accuracy, I would want to lure it, but it does require luring skill. Yes, you, you can't just say, oh, well, I use food and it didn't work. Luring's a waste of time. There's nothing nothing that can be a waste of time. It's the application of it that lets it down. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just the same as what we hear about, oh, clicker training's a waste of time. Yeah, but your timing's boo. So no wonder the dog can't work out what you're doing. So exquisite luring, when you watch it, it looks so straightforward and so easy. 
you wonder why you never did it. But then when you start to do it, you realise it needs good hands. It certainly needs good hands, good balance. Yep. And it needs a plan to fade the lure. Well, you need to transition to the new cue. You can keep the lure coming backwards and forwards. You know, we, we have this, oh, I have to come off the lure. No, the lure just has to be delayed. So in other words, if, if you're going to feed the dog treats anyway, instead of the luring eliciting the behavior, you're saying the luring is going to come as a consequence of the behavior. So it's not about fading the lure. It's about delaying the lure. Delaying the putting, it into the, putting it into the consequence categories. Yeah, I mean, say you'd lured a dog yeah. to do this exquisite drop action backwards. Your hand takes the dog backwards because his nose follows down to go backwards. You could then mark it, but the piece of food in your hand doesn't have to be the one the dog gets. You could click that and then go, hey, let's go shopping and find you some food. You with me? The lure doesn't have to be the piece of food the dog gets. And that's how I do the transition from hand luring to operant choice certainly the hand gesture needs to stay there and it needs to be identical but as soon as we've done half a dozen mark and travel to go and get the food or run and get the food it, the food in the hand starts to become irrelevant because they know they're going to get food for having completed the behavior so are you fading the lure or just delaying transitioning into consequence is it a fade If your interest is piqued and you want to learn more about the skills and application of luring, take a look at the episode notes for links to more information. There's also a link to sign up for the online six-week course on the skills of luring, and it starts May 8th on learningaboutdogs.com. Thanks for listening. Leave a review on iTunes and also tell a friend you're a fan of the podcast.